truth, okay. I know things about the world or I wouldn't turn a buck. Not necessarily nice things. The eighth episode of Succession's third season, Kiantishar, is all about confronting the truth. It may sound like the most simple source of conflict, two characters sit down and reveal the truth to one another, but for Succession, despite the Roy family running a media empire, the truth is something hard to come by. With so many ulterior motives, power differentials, and appearances to maintain, the characters exist within a web of lies. For Logan's children, people avoid telling them the truth, resulting in them never truly facing the consequences of their actions, so they're protected from all the dangers of the outside world at the cost of enduring the torture of their father. Or as Marcia put it in season one, he made you a playground, and you think it's the whole world. Everyone is so used to lying and deceiving in order to achieve their next goal, that they don't seem to really know what the truth is anymore. But this episode maintained the truth as a punishing theme for each character, making it one of the most powerful episodes of the entire series so far, and it happened over six masterfully written scenes. The first scene that establishes this theme is when Greg gets a lot of kudos from Shiv and Tom for managing to date Comfrey, someone he has pursued as a goal for several episodes. However, Greg already feels that their dynamic is missing something. I do wonder... Is there depth there? Sure. Like, is, I don't, is there substance? Greg's more romantic view of dating is mocked and dismissed by Shiv and Tom, who instead view this as a good dating strategy for Greg to get on the date ladder. This shows the key difference in how the Roy family views people versus how a normal person does. Greg isn't fully indoctrinated to this mindset yet, so he doesn't want something fake. When he initially pursued Comfrey, it was out of genuine optimism, but it feels stale in practice because of her potential ulterior motives. <laughs> Maybe I wonder when she gets to know the quote-unquote real me, uh, will she stick around? Having witnessed how empty and unhappy fake relationships around him appear to be, Greg actually wants to ask the tough questions that the other family members avoid, such as, does she really like me? And the answer to that question could be painful, but it seems that the truth is of no concern to Shiv or Tom yet. Having set the table of some characters not wanting something fake, the rest of the conflict in this episode grants them that wish, exposing the raw truth beneath the surface. The family fly out to Italy to their mother's wedding. Despite not wanting to go, Shiv attends for appearance sakes. Something that always shines through in Succession's writing is how even the most intimate of dynamics, like mother and daughter, becomes tainted with business talk, as one by one they all try to convince their mother to get a prenup, as protecting the wealth always comes first. They quickly devolve into disagreement about who has contributed more to their failing relationship, meaning they have to look back at why she was such an absent figure in their life. She believes they chose to live with Logan, even though she simultaneously admits that she gave him custody to protect their shares. And you knew how to twist the knife. You knew then, and you know now. And I might cry. Oh yeah, where's the onion? Shiv sees all of this as just manipulatively playing the victim, which makes it easier for her to dismiss everything she's saying. But after this small battle for who's a better or worse person, tossing around accusations like a game of hot potato, her mother reveals something true, and just notice how the truth hits differently to business talk or competition. Truth is, I probably should never have had children. Some people just aren't made to be mothers. There's a quiet heartbreak in Shiv's face, as if the truth just punched her in the gut. Their dynamic always had this undercurrent of bitterness, but it was more comfortable to not be able to pinpoint why. It's easier to bicker and lie about who's really at fault than to hear your own mother admit that she regrets having you. There's a noticeable void inside of Shiv, and this conversation just deepened it. She then twists the knife by saying she wished she could have had dogs instead, but she couldn't because of Logan, stating he never saw anything he loved that he didn't want to kick it to see if it would still come back. There's something incredibly raw about this sentence, especially coming from the mother of these children, the former wife of Logan Roy. It provides real insight into how this family has been taught to love. 
And this quote carries through to the next scene, where a combative Shiv wants to roleplay with Tom, who tells her to take the lead. So she does, but instead of it being fun, it's harsh and exposing. You're not good enough for me. Well, let's mm -hmm. see about that. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. way out of your f***ing league. Oh, you think so? Yeah? Uh-huh. The acting of Matthew McFadden here is incredible, just the way he looks at her. He's searching for a way for it not to be true, for her to smile, to laugh, to something, but she doesn't. You love me. F*** you. You can see he both means it and wants to stop the game, but has no alternative other than to play along. Even though I don't love you. But you want me anyway. And now she twists the knife, breaking his heart with the truth. The role play is meant to be demeaning and dominating, but it's just hurtful because it's all true. He's always secretly suspected it, but now she's admitting it. The question Greg was asking himself earlier, does she really like me, is something Tom now has to grapple with. When he chooses to finally kiss her to end the scene, it's like a sad acceptance, a submission to her power, an acknowledgement that he'll always be beneath her. If we recall the quote from the last scene, we start to see how much Shiv actually resembles her father, that maybe she doesn't know how to love, only to test Tom's limits and capacity for love by kicking him away all the time to see if he comes back, which is painful for the character and agonizing for the audience, because we know how sensitive and in need of validation Tom truly is. In the fifth scene, Kendall sits down with his father to end their conflict. The scene starts with Logan not even trusting the food he's been served, and calls his grandson out to taste it first. This shows us that in order to get to the truth, Logan will attack your greatest weakness first. This scene between these two is one of the most powerful in the series. In an earlier episode, the power came from the silence between them, everything that was unspoken. But this time it's all about what's finally willing to be said. After suspecting him of poisoning him, Kendall asks his father, who do you think I am? You think I want you dead? I'll be broken when you die. But Logan's response is dismissive. Mm -hmm. He sees through the false sentiment. This scene is intended to be a confession from Kendall, admitting that he's not who he thought he was, that he can't be his father, that he submits, that he lost. He just wants the money that he was offered in the last episode, and he'll be gone forever. It's actually Kendall being honest with himself, or so he thinks. It's important to establish that Logan knows the truth. He sees the truth in people, who they really are, what they really want, and why they will or won't get it. It's this core understanding of people that allows him to bulldoze over them, exploiting their vices. This scene showcases the key difference between their worldviews. Logan is brutal, harsh, and dark. Hey, life's not nice on horseback. It's a number on a piece of paper. It's a fight for a knife in the mud. This killer instinct is what allowed him to fight his way to the top. Whereas Kendall, like Marcia said in season one, was born into a playground his father built for him. Logan could almost respect Kendall's submission, except that Kendall then reveals that he's given himself a comforting narrative, a safety blanket to soften the blow of his failure. You've won because you're corrupt and so is the world. I'm better than you. You're kind of evil. This turns into a similar dynamic between Shiv and her mother in the previous scene, where they bicker over who's a better person. But unlike their mother, Logan won't hurt you by confessing he's the bad guy. He'll attack your weakness, the truth you're hiding from yourself. He wants you to drown in the pain of your own failure, so you'll learn the lesson. So he rejects Kendall's offer to quit for a payout, confronts him about the waiter he accidentally killed, and speculates on potential storylines as to what he was even doing that night. Were he and the waiter going off to chase women? Or is he secretly gay? Or was it just the drugs? You can practically see the news headlines he could pump out, bullying his full reign of power over him. I know who you are, I know what you want, and I know your vices. Then he strips Kendall of the last thing he has, the story he's clinging to to justify his failures. And whenever you f up, I cleaned up your shit. And I'm a bad person? The truth hurts, and you can see it in Kendall's face here. He's processing the reality that he isn't really a good person. He's only allowed to perceive himself as good because his father has covered up his crimes, 
and he's so superficial that he buys into the public's perception of him as reality. Logan perceives himself as all-knowing, which is why the final revelation of this episode angers him so much, because he didn't see it coming. He had thought Roman was capable and starting to prove himself, and he was, but although he wouldn't reveal his weakness to Madsen in the previous scene, now he just accidentally sent it to Logan, making the person he cares most about extremely vulnerable. Just like his siblings, Roman isn't used to facing the consequences of his actions, but now that the truth is out, just look at how uncomfortable he seems with the reality of who he is and what he does. He's just a scared child again, like the rest of them. That's what's so fascinating about the writing in succession, that although the characters seem morally bereft, we occasionally get these glimpses into their humanity. Beneath the surface, behind the web of lies, they're all very emotionally isolated, damaged, and empty. For the incredibly wealthy and powerful, the world is at your fingertips, and you can get away with creating your own false reality, filled with fake smiles and a coercive sense of belonging and support. But for a family who own a media empire that should be all about separating fact from fiction, they're all far more comfortable living in the lie, hiding behind it, because unfortunately, as we all know, nothing hurts more than the truth. Well, you've made it this far, so you might as well like, comment and subscribe to help get this channel to the next level.